Hi, my name is Dr. Tony Hampton. I am a family physician, and I started practicing medicine in 1995. I believe that we are a reflection of our life experiences, which create our belief systems. Those belief systems sometimes don't serve us in terms of our health, and I really believe that my role as a physician is to help my patients adapt new belief systems based on evidence-based medicine. I also believe that our thoughts are what determines how we will make decisions. Therefore, I encourage my patients to have positive thoughts about their healthcare journey. I tell you, life changing. I had no idea that I had done so much life changing and that was really my purpose when I became an author. I was really trying to change the life of my wife because she developed type 1 diabetes out of the blue a few years ago and as I took my journey I realized as I had all these aha moments which you'll find that you'll have today that this could impact more than just what's going on at home. It actually can impact what's going on at work and in the rest of the world. And even today, one of my 10 patients I saw was a 72-year-old who had been on insulin since 1998. And he was on about 60 units twice a day when I first met him. And as of today, he's down to five units twice a day. And I'm certain within the next few months, he'll be off of insulin, which is something you really think is not possible, but it's very possible. And to be honest with you, I actually am just as surprised as I interact with my patients when they share these great stories. So, so I want to take you on a little bit of a journey to help you understand why my life has changed, my wife's and, of course, my patients and hopefully the rest of the world. So the book is what kind of led to this journey. I was just looking for a way to have a tax write-off, to be honest. I was just looking for something <laughs> to do to reduce my debt burden because I'm trying to pay off my mortgage. And my, my uh, accountant said, you need to have a home-based business. So my wife said, don't create a job, create something you enjoy. So I realized I was a teacher, so I said, I'm going to teach. And this is what led to the book. Titles. I have a lot of titles with Advocate Healthcare. That's the largest health system in Illinois. But in spite of those titles, working with the Illinois Department of Public Health for Diabetes, you know, chair of this, vice chair of that, the title that's the most important for me is that of being a teacher. And George was my coach, and still is, and being a coach. So George taught me the value of being coached. And I'm finding that as a parent, a husband, and as a physician and a leader, coaching is probably the most important thing. I know as lean students, we're all kind of learning the value of coaching. So I didn't know who this was, to be honest. I just liked this quote. <laughs> I grew up in a tough neighborhood. I didn't know who he was. <laughs> but the bottom line is this, mine being like a parachute, and it doesn't work if it's not open. So today it's about opening your mind, so looking at things in a different way, so that you can then take that to help you continuously grow and learn as we have learned in Lean Principles. So I'm excited because prior to this journey, I was managing disease and controlling disease, but I was not reversing disease and preventing disease. It's a completely different experience when you go to your office and just like that gentleman I spoke of, he's excited because I'm taking him off of medicine, not putting him on additional medicine. Your entire practice changes and you, the love of medicine returns because we all went into medicine to be healers. This is what we're going to learn today. Why is diabetes and obesity an epidemic? explain why the medicines don't really get to the root cause, it just controls and manages disease, understand that fat is not linked to heart disease and that a low-carb, high-fat diet is probably the best option for most of us, and shift from disease management to a model of healing. He uh, healing. One thing I want to mention as it speaks to the third bullet point, low-carb, high-fat in my mind is the best option for most of us, but when you look at documentaries like What the Health, 
If you haven't seen What the Help, you should check that out. Or that uh, sugar film, they're kind of contrary. One saying be a vegetarian, the other saying low fat, low sugar, right? I mean low carb. So you need to understand that they both work, right? So you have to find what works for you, but a vegetarian diet that's starchy is still going to make you sick. So even if you're a vegetarian or vegan, you still can't eat a lot of starchy food all the time. This is my, uh, my quote at the beginning of the book. I looked at other people's book and I said, they have a little saying, so let me have one. And mine was that I treat diabetic, I use medicines to control symptoms, and I use the diet to reverse disease. And that's the bottom line. So, and you'll understand that clearly in a moment. The diabetes epidemic, as you know, is out of control. And 422 million people and when you think about it in the world, that's four times what it was a very short time ago. So something happened. And then the borderline diabetes is even more pervasive. 86 million in this country are borderline. So when you add the borderline to the diabetic, you're at about 114 million Americans who are diabetic or borderline. That means one out of every three people that you know and love either have it or are borderline and 90% of the borderline people don't even know it. So that's, again, an epidemic. And it's not like a minor casual conversation. And then, of course, the impact diabetes has a huge impact on death in this country. It says number seven, but arguably worse impact. It is the number one cause of blindness and preventable amputations and also kidney failure. But when it comes to heart disease and stroke, it's right up there as the top and leading causes. So diabetes has an incredible impact. Obviously, it costs a lot of money. So we're saying one in three of our friends and family are borderline. One in three of our friends and family will be diabetic by the year 2050. And when I talk about diabetes, just put obesity in your head. It's the same thing. So this is what got us here. And I can go down another 10 things, but we only have an hour, right? So low-fat diets don't necessarily work, and I'll explain why. Fructose is a bad thing, a form of sugar from corn. Processed foods, we already know what that means. And when I think about processed foods, I think about flour, cornmeal, a tablespoon of flour is equivalent to half a tablespoon of sugar. So it's true of cornmeal. So that's why things like pasta, we have to be a little cautious about that. And I love pasta, so I don't know if I have any Italians in here, but I don't want to offend. <laughs> and then socioeconomic factors. So Ansel Keys, respected scientist from the 50s, 60s, and 70s, suggested that cholesterol and fat were correlated to heart disease. And that's why our bacon is not smiling. That was in 1984, but what happened? Apparently, Eat Butter made the cover in 2014, and what it says on the cover is scientists label fat the enemy, why they were wrong. And so when Ansel Keys make these rec made these recommendations, the American Heart Association, well respected throughout the world, uh, suggested we go on a low-fat diet, and guess what we did? We went on a low-fat diet and we got sicker. So there was something wrong. So when they went back and looked at the data, they saw there was a little flaw in the data, and here's the flaw. So he submitted seven countries. And of course, as you go to the right, that's more fat in your diet. As you go up, there's more death. So who's at the top? The good old US of A. Oh, George, who's number two? Canada. Sorry, George. <laughs> and I love Canada. I just learned on YouTube, because you learn everything on YouTube, right, that Canada was in the top 10 for countries difficult to invade, partly because they're protected by the U.S. of A. <laughs> <laughs> just threw that in there, too. <laughs> right. <laughs> All right. That's a long conversation, George. All right. So, but if you look at, this is what he submitted, right? But this is what he did. He did a 22 country study. And what you find is that there's countries here at the bottom, Holland, 
Norway, etc., that eat a lot of fat and they don't get a lot of heart disease. So there's a disconnect between what he was saying and what was reality. So when they went back and looked at the data again, they found that the thing that correlated to heart disease was not fat, but sugar. It was sugar. So just so the first thing I want you to change the way you think and open your mind is fat does not make you fat and fat does not cause heart disease because I'm going to try to convince you to eat a whole lot of fat today. The second issue is fructose and fructose which is taking corn and turning into sugar was the second factor. By the way this happened in the 70s and Fructose became part of our culture, just like that low fat recommendation in the 70s. All happened, it's like a perfect storm. So why did it happen? Well, in 1966, is, is Mr. Shingo still in the building? But I know he's around, but Japan figured out how to turn corn into fructose, okay? And, and then we had a relationship with Cuba, and Cuba, um, basically, we didn't have a great relationship and we had to stop receiving our sugar from Cuba. And then we started getting it from Florida. But then, because of what was discovered in Japan, we decided it was cheaper to make sugar out of fructose and corn. And coupled with subsidies from Nixon, so Nixon subsidized corn and soy, so everything got cheaper. And so that's why 80% of all the food in the grocery store that's in a box has added sugar, not just fructose, other forms. So 80%. So that's why rather it's the barbecue sauce or the ketchup, you need to pay attention to those labels. So now we have our second factor. Our third is processed food. Back in 1900 or so, 5 to 10% of our food came from the food that we got it, you know. It was all, basically everything was at home except for five to 10 percent. But now, this is only in 2009, we're up to about 50 to 60 percent of the food we eat is not at home. So I know you guys had a healthy meal today, but a lot of the food that's out there is not. And then the last thing is social economic factors in Chicago. There's a, a lot of food deserts, particularly on the south side and the west side, so they don't have access to food. So even when we do, we're doing an educational conference next Friday for Advocate at the Hilton in Oak Lawn, and we're teaching people how to eat. I even made a little video about, you know, cooking food, and we're going to then look in their neighborhoods and only make recommendations based on what they have access to. Otherwise, it's disingenuous to ask people to eat uh, an avocado if that's not even in their grocery store, you know. So, now, this is a little bit of the science, and this is, I'll be presenting this information at the Midwest Physicians uh, meeting, which is the Academy of Family Physicians in a few weeks. And that's why I had to make my slides doctor and non-doctor friendly. This slide is from Lipitz, uh, in now this is 2008, so we're going back, you know, almost 10 years. And this slide is just reminding us that if you eat a low-fat diet where you only have 12 grams of fat and 208 carbs for this example, and then you compare it to a low-carb diet where you have 45 carbs and 36 grams of fat, those circles represent how much fat is in your arteries. So the question would be, why would a low carbohydrate diet actually end up with less fat in your arteries? You would think the low fat diet would do that, right? Well, the reason why is because when you eat, basically what you eat becomes your fuel. So if I eat a lot of fat, my body converts to fat metabolism. So if I eat a low-carb diet, my body is going to start using fat as a source of energy, including the fat around your belly and in your arteries. So you actually burn the fat in your arteries and reduce the incidence of clogged arteries eating a low-carb diet. So that bacon and egg picture you saw earlier, which sounded so contrary to your arteries, may actually be better for your arteries, which is a aha moment for me. And also, a happy moment since I was a vegetarian before I took this journey. And I wanted to go back to the bacon and eggs a little bit, you know, to be honest. <laughs> My wife's from Mississippi, so, you know, what you expect. <laughs> this study done in the Archives of Internal Medicine 
show that yes, the low fat diet is good because it does lower your LDL that's at the top and the low carb diet and the low carb diet does it as well but a little bit more with low fat and the low carb diet lowers your triglycerides and increases your HDL which is the good cholesterol and so the point of this slide is that I don't want to demonize a low fat diet completely what I'm trying to say is that for the majority of us we may want to reconsider rather that's the best option I'll explain it with the next slide but ultimately they both can help you, but it won't really matter because what you'll find clinicians start talking about is it's about inflammation. You'll hear that in the media. It's about inflammation. It's not really about cholesterol, right? So if we reduce inflammation, we're okay. Now, the Lipitor people are happy because their drugs reduce inflammation. So even if the cholesterol doesn't even change, there's benefit. The question is, is that the first or best approach and I'm su suggesting that your diet may be able to get the job done by itself. So here's the study that converted me from a vegetarian. So vegetarian, almost vegan, A to Z study, Atkins was the A, T for traditional, O for Ornish, Ornish and then uh, Zone was the Z and uh, Ornish and Zone are vegetarian diets and if I, I should have a slide with the comparing those diets on a, a chart, but the bottom line is this study convinced me that the low carb diet made the most sense. Why? Because two out of three Americans are insulin resistant, meaning they just can't metabolize insulin uh, or sugar properly, and only one third are insulin sensitive. So. When I look at, and then when you start looking at the population I serve, which is a, a minority population, it's probably 80 to 90 percent. So it made sense for me to recommend a diet that reduces weight in both insulin resistant and insulin sensitive people when the low fat diet doesn't do a great job for insulin resistant people. So it does an okay job, but if I'm in a conversation with patients, to me it made more sense to go with the one that works for both. It's just an easier decision. So, is diabetes a progressive disease? The answer is that's what we've been taught. Like when you think about something like COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease or bronchitis emphysema, we, that's pretty much a progressive disease for the most part. It's hard to reverse that. Diabetes, I'm not sure, so, but, the, but we've been taught and I, was, I will be speaking for the American Diabetes Association next month, so I'm not demonizing them. What I'm saying is that we've been taught that it's a progressive disease. But it's hard to convince my patient that I talked to you about today who's getting off of insulin that it's a progressive disease. Most of us who have type 2 have some islet cells which make insulin that's still there. They're just not functioning very well and they're on their last leg. Imagine giving them a little bit of a break and allowing them to recover. And the reality is for most people, 90% or more, they can actually reverse disease. I think it's somatics. In other words, I say reverse. The next person say, they're off medicine, you're just controlling it. Whatever. <laughs> they're off medicine, and they're happy they're off medicine, no co-pays. Yeah. <laughs> so, if you consider it a progressive disease, it makes sense because you tell them to do a diet and exercise, they don't do it because you haven't told them how to do it. You put them on a pill, then you put them on a pill, then you put them on insulin. And yeah, it keeps getting worse. So yeah, it's a progressive disease based on that theory. But what I discovered as I did my research is that I was focused on controlling sugars and the reality was I didn't know if the sugar was a symptom or the disease and I quite frankly my practice of medicine suggested it was a disease so I was trying to if I controlled the sugar I felt like a good doctor right and the patient felt good everybody was happy even though they were getting more and more medicine but what I discovered is that no I also learned in medical school that insulin resistance for type 2 diabetes is what Type 2 diabetes, the insulin's just not working well. They always use the example of how it's like insulin's the key to open up the lock and then it lets the sugar in. The bottom line is that it didn't do a good job. So that was another aha moment. I said, I'm focused on treating 
something I shouldn't be focused on is sugars. I should be focused on insulin resistance. It's just kind of logical, and this is why. So when I treat pneumonia, I know that a fever is a symptom, and I may give a patient Tylenol, but I haven't finished my job if I stop there. I need to treat the infection with antibiotics. Same is true of diabetes. If I focus only on the sugar, which is a symptom, I don't focus on insulin resistance, then I'm not really helping to make the patient better. So part of the purpose of this discussion is to tell you that the current treatment is directed at the wrong thing. We're focused on the wrong thing. And so, and I'm going to show you a few studies in a couple of slides that show you exactly what I mean. When, even when you tightly control people's sugar, they still get sick, which is very discouraging if you're a patient. So, causes of insulin resistance. Well, one of the main causes of insulin resistance is insulin. Wow. Is there any pharmaceutical people here? Now, my wife is a type 1, so if she doesn't have insulin, she dies, right? So I don't have a problem with insulin. I want my wife, right? Well, but high insulin levels increases insulin resistance, leading to your need for more insulin to overcome that, leading to increased insulin resistance. So if we were to compare insulin to any other hormone, because insulin is a hormone or any other drug, you would better understand it. Now, if Mr. Shing, if I look at Mr. Shingo, I don't see a guy that's like a heavy drinker. Now, if you got some secrets to tell me, tell me. <laughs> so if he has a glass of wine, I anticipate his tolerances. You know, he can't handle it. So he has one glass, and now we're carrying him up to the room, right? Now, I don't know about George, but I'm assuming George can handle more than one. <laughs> so if that's true, then he has, okay. So the bottom line is, your tolerance is, is, is going to be less based on uh, exposure and vice versa. So insulin is the same way. The more insulin you expose yourself to, the more tolerant you become. Just think of that as insulin resistance. The more insulin you need, the more tolerant you become. So it's just a, you never get, you get sicker. And that's what I want you guys to be thinking about. So how do we, what do we do? So the current treatment makes insulin resistant worse because most of the drugs out there actually increase insulin production. And then we think it's a chronic disease, which is not. And finally, even when we tightly control diabetes, it still results in uh, you getting sick. So here's another study. And again, I'm prepping this so that when I talk to my physician colleagues, they'll be able to look up the studies and we'll make sure all of these slides are available to you if you want to refer back to them. Because I'm just trying to teach. I was, I was born to teach. So if you look at the bottom, most doctors know about the advanced study and the accord study. They may not know about the other two. But when they did a meta-analysis comparing all of these studies where you tightly control sugars, I'm talking about getting it down to like uh, hemoglobin A1C, which is what it looks like over the last three months of 6.5. That's perfect control, right? If you look at this, more intensively controlled people had more deaths, 980 compared to 884, more heart disease, more strokes, tight control. So why the heck does that happen? I think it happens because if you focus on controlling the symptoms, which is a high sugar, you're not making people better. And I also think that insulin is inflammatory, it's the fat storage hormone, we can go down the list, and too much insulin in your body is a problem. That's why my wife, who's type 1, is not going to be able to get off insulin necessarily, but she'll be on minimum doses of insulin because she won't need that much because she's eating the right food. The, no, nah, she developed it about six years ago, and um, it was a kind of a shocker, but you know, it kind of, you know, it just, it just jokes you when your life is okay and then something sneaks up on you. And I'm definitely going to make sure we have some questions for the end because I think there's so many things that are going through your head right now. One of the drugs out there is Acrobose. I don't use it much, but this is pretty startling. You have a drug that doesn't even work that well, to be honest, to lower your sugar. But it doesn't raise insulin. Certain drugs don't raise insulin like metformin. And that's why it's such a popular drug. What we found is that even when you use a drug that lowers the sugar just a little bit, but it doesn't raise insulin, less people got sick. 
they actually had less heart disease in that setting versus tight control with insulin. It's just mind-boggling. So we know that insulin, there's a problem with insulin. So what are we going to do about it? So we want to improve insulin resistance. How many people want to have surgery? Anybody ready for surgery? Nah. No cosmetic <laughs> surgery. Just who put her in audience? <laughs> okay, gotcha. <laughs> so most people don't want surgery. Surgery will reverse diabetes quite effectively. However, that's an expensive undertaking. Intermittent fasting, let's compare the two. So when you look at, you know, when you make people fast before they have surgery, the blue represents um, how much weight loss they had. So you actually have more weight loss compared to the people who actually had the surgery, which is amazing. And you had better sugar control here. That's how high up the sugar went, 1,200 or so, versus people who had the surgery. So even when you compare bariatric surgery to uh, fasting, that's actually not a bad way to go. But the real question is, you know, I like to eat, Doc. What are you talking about fasting? I mean, who wants to come to a nice conference like this and starve to death, right? Well, as you know, fasting's been around forever. And if you want to reduce insulin levels, how about not eating, right? That's pretty simple. That's common sense, right? Well, let's think about that for a moment. Um, I, I always use this uh, Jason, Dr. Jason Fong, and he's from Canada also, so I do have love for Canada. A uh, nice doctor, I think he's a nephrologist, and he taught me about the two compartment syndrome. So insulin does store fat. You store it as glycogen, you store it as uh, fat, you store sugar as glycogen and fat. And basically, I use your imagination and, and consider glycogen your refrigerator and consider the fat your freezer. So if you have dinner and don't eat until the next morning, you are going into your refrigerator to get the glycogen and use it as a source of energy. If you wake up and don't eat because you're fasting, then you will then start to burn the fat that's in the refri freezer. Now, of course, if you put something in the refrigerator in the morning, you ate some oatmeal or something, there's no need to go into the freezer. So when you do fasting, even for a short time, now you can get to the fat burning that you really need to get to if you're going to be effective. Not only to control your sugars, but to control your weight. And by the way, doctors always say to the patient, you got to eat because you're on medicine. You got to eat because you're on medicine. How about if you don't eat, you don't take the medicine? Is that a different way of thinking? It's very simple, but it, I'm not going to take my glyburide because I didn't have breakfast as opposed to I gotta eat because I gotta take my glyber right. So we have to change how we think about this stuff, okay? Now, why and how? So intermittent fasting does trigger growth hormone. And when you think about growth hormone, you think about you know, getting fat, but in, it's quite the opposite. Growth hormone is really important for muscle and it also helps you to burn fat. So you really want that because a lot of people think if I fast, I'm gonna lose muscle mass. It's actually quite the opposite. You actually preserve muscle mass. It reduces insulin because you're fasting. And then, so I tell people when you want to try this, if you're, because we've been telling people, eat frequent small meals, make sure you eat a snack. So what you do is you say, okay, eat three meals a day, no snacks. That's how you start the transition. And then once you get, and then what you have to do is add fat for, with your meals so that you'll feel full. Because if you eat sugary, starchy food, it's going to go up and then come down really fast. And then you're going to want to eat again. Um, so what you do is, let's just say breakfast is normally 7 in the morning and you're going to try to stretch it out. So let's see if we can get to 9 or, or 10. And, and what, I, what I did when I first started is I would bring me a smoothie, make sure I had fat in it like an avocado or something or some nut butters. And what I would do is see how long I can go. Now it's much easier for guys to do this than for ladies, but what you find is that each day it gets easier and easier. Next thing you know, you're at noon. If you get to noon, that's 16 hours of fasting for most people, and that's all you really need. I tend to do a 24, where I just have a four-hour window. I did eat lunch today because we had some food that they brought, and it was reasonably healthy. But, so I usually eat between four and eight because I'm so busy. And as you know, most doctors don't get lunch breaks anyway, right? So you just work, 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 and drink a lot of fluid. But that's what I do. But the bottom line is that intermittent fasting is probably, if you walk away with one thing today, if you can try to do this, this will change your life. Those are the different types. We talked about 16-8, where you're fasting for 16 hours. You have an eight-hour window. 
24 hour fast is just dinner and dinner and dinner, drinking a lot of fluids in between. And then you have 20 hour fast where you eat, have the four hour window. And then the 522 is just when you have 500 calories two days out of the week. Doesn't really matter which days. This is what you do to get through it because some people try this, particularly ladies, headache, lightheadedness, fatigue, constipation. Who wants that, right? So the first thing is to stay hydrated. So a little lemon water is critical, things like that. I drink, uh, basically I don't get my sugar from my drinks. That's my rule. I don't get carbs from my drink. So rather it's water, tea, coffee, I'm not adding any sugar. I find alternatives. Stress will make you increase uh, cortisol and that'll result in increased uh, sugar from your liver. I say pink salt because it has more minerals, that Himalayan salt is your best bet, but just, you know, the irony is that you can eat more fat and add salt, so that you can work with some food then, right? <laughs> and uh, magnesium, uh, you tend to lose magnesium and potassium sometimes when you're fasting, so sometimes you have to supplement for that, and uh, I just wanted to add those as options to help get through that bumpy period. I always ask people to give themselves one or two weeks to adjust to this type of eating. So this is a better food period. At the bottom is fat. That's our foundation. Fat is our friend because fat, as you'll see, doesn't really raise your sugar much at all. So we like to throw avocados wherever we can. Coconut oil can handle that high temperature. So we want to cook with coconut oil as much as possible. Most of my patients are not buying grass-fed or free range. But if you want to be a purist, that's your best bet. You know, it's more nutrition. Uh, things like that and um, then when you go up to the next layer you got the non-starchy vegetables there's so many vegetables and the ones you have to avoid are so few and I'll show those in a moment and then there's certain things that are low glycemic low sugar spiking and those are the berries the lemons the limes etc and then finally as you get up further up it does say wild caught this and that again ideal just eat your meat with non-starchy vegetables, your nuts and seeds, your pickles, etc. And then if you're going to use a sweetener, my two favorite are stevia and monk fruit because they're not as inflammatory. I think it's best to, monk fruit, make sure it says pure. And if it's pure, you can actually work with that. But those are just giving you some options. And again, all these slides will be at your disposal. So we know what the starchy foods are, right? Man, don't we just love bread when it's nice and warm with butter? Oh, at one of your favorite restaurants. Pasta, don't forget, that's not real food. It's flour, water, and a little egg. Do you want to feed your family flour, water, and a little egg, or do you want to feed them some zucchini pasta? I'm just saying. Just something to consider. Rice, potatoes, beans are high in fiber, but they are starchy, so they're on the list, but you can kind of use those in moderation. We definitely still eat beans and then most nuts and seeds are fine. They just have chestnuts as a starchy example. The only, so when I tell my patients about eating, uh, avoiding these foods, what I say to them is I'm only giving you like, you know, what is this, seven, eight vegetables? Yeah. And the only thing that's missing is acorn squash. You have your beets and sweet peas and butternut squash and parsnips and your white and red potatoes, corn, and then the plantains. But it's only one thing missing. I'm saying to you, all the other vegetables are probably okay. So I'm not asking you to just completely eliminate. I mean, come on. <laughs> let, me, let me explain something real quick. And then I'll <laughs> I took some plain looking uh, cauliflower out of a package. I normally do other stuff with it. I use it for rice and other stuff, right? And I, I put some coconut oil in a pan with some butter and I just kind of, and some garlic and I just, and I browned it just a little bit. And cauliflower is totally different when you hook it up. When you can use salt and butter and cheese and you can throw the mic at it. <laughs> so don't, don't think about that old school cauliflower that your grandmother used to make. I'm talking about putting your foot in it and you can work it out. This is uh, some substitutes, rice and um, mashed cauliflower, some squash and zucchini noodles, and of course, we even make, this is, let me give you an example, I'll try to make this really simple. Take pasta, boil it, 
put it in your mouth. No seasoning. What does it taste like? Crap. Take, you know, cauliflower, pretty much the same thing. All you're doing is doing what you did to the pasta, to the cauliflower. It's going to taste just as good. And it's real food. But you didn't think about it that way. But, it, but rice and pasta tastes like nothing until you hook it up. So all I'm saying is hook it up and it'll taste delicious. So I keep things simple. This is a little extreme saying 20 grams of carbs. I'm more at a 50 gram of carb level for most of my patients. Most of my patients are doing 300 carbs a day. So this is like an extreme example, but you know, a little bacon and eggs, you can hook it up the way you'd like. Um, rather it's a chicken salad or a salmon salad, perfect. Even when I traveled to Wash U to take my kids to school, uh, a few weeks ago, we stopped by a fast food place and we got, I got a double cheeseburger with bacon and eggs and bunless. And the lady didn't flinch when I said bunless, meant, meant, so other people must be asking for it. And she automatically gave me a, a fork and a knife. I was like, wow. And this is in the country in rural Illinois somewhere. I couldn't believe it. Um, so other people are doing this. Obviously, any meat you want with the broccoli, you just got to know how to cook the broccoli, not the way they made it back in the day. Make it taste good. And then your non-sugary drinks. This is, this is part of what I give my patients. I'll make sure you guys have my card, drtonyhampton.com. I have a handout I give my patients, so check that out. The only thing I ask that you do when you leave here is to, because I'm all about getting the message out, follow me on social media, LinkedIn or something, and then like some stuff every once in a while. And that way other people can learn this. Because a lot of people that you know and love need to learn this stuff, trust me. They're desperate for an answer. Why do we love fat? Well, because fat does not raise your sugar, as you can see from this, growth, this curve. You see what the carbs do. And that protein, if that was chicken, that was baked, that, it would look like a heel. If you fry it and add the flour to it, it would look like that carbohydrate curve. So baking it is better, just remember that. And some people take pork skins and use that as their batter. They dip the chicken in egg, and then they use pork skins as a batter. They bake it and it tastes like fried chicken. What? Now you know my wife must be from the South when she came up with that one. <laughs> and it actually is a zero carb chicken, so just keep that in mind. Zero carb chicken. So here you go. You know what these fats are. Obviously, if it's chocolate, it needs to be dark chocolate. We have to increase the fat in our diet. They got some really cool apps out there that'll help with that. Here are some oils. And I'm just gonna, again, this is something you can refer back to, but coconut oil, I, I like to use that, that for frying. I use MCT oil with my coffee, you know, butter. Ghee is like, you know, a form of butter that a lot of Indian cultures use and they just kind of let the liquid come off and it's just a pure form of butter. Uh, tallow is more like, um, you know, like a beef. It's amazing that lard, all I'm saying, I mean, we used to like really frown on that. Now I'm saying it's okay. So this just gives you an idea. Olive oil, be careful with it. You can definitely do some quick cooking with it, but don't do any high heat cooking because it can turn into cancer forming elements. Here's an example that you have to understand comparing the low carb, high fat to a regular good old standard American diet. Protein is about the same. That's important because with Atkins, I think a lot of people went too crazy on the, the protein. And that's, oh, it's, protein's not too bad, but if you eat too much protein, it's gonna still start to act like a carb. So what you're trying to do is increase the fat. Look at that, 35, 167. And if you do that, you're going you're gonna to make good things happen. And then here's an example of what most people would consider a pretty healthy American diet. The cereal with the banana and the skim milk and the sandwich with the whole wheat bread and all those good things. And you got the stir fry, but you're using pasta. And then you got your little snacks. And all this sounds like pretty typical, but this is a 300 carb meal. And it just doesn't look like it, but it is. Now, this is a, now the question is, would you prefer this or would you prefer this? An uh, egg omelet with some spinach and kale, salmon salad, yummy, yummy, yummy. That steak that you love, you're going to hook those vegetables up and cook it the right way. This is probably like a 60 carb meal. And quite frankly, I don't see that it's, I mean, cereal, egg omelet. You tell me which one you want. 
it was an easy decision for me. In fact, I'm eating much better. <laughs> I'm much happier eating this way than I've ever been. So, more fat in your diet, that's the same slide we showed earlier. This is just, I really am not gonna stay here. It's just showing how people's numbers, as you go to the left, gets better. I have, last Thursday, I had my first eight patients, six of the first eight patients had either a 10 to 20 pound weight loss since I last saw them in one day. So this is, I should, I'm gonna redo these slides, but it, you know, it's ridiculous. And people are just losing weight and I never had a practice of medicine that was like that. So, so reading labels is what I tell my patients. This is part of the handout that I give to my patients. Get the carbs less than 50, increase the fat consumption, and consider intermittent fasting if that's something they can handle. These are just resources. Again, you'll have access to this information. I love the diet doctor. I love Dr. Jason Fung. I think we all have to have a voice out here to reach as many people as we can. And I also believe we should work in partnership with the pharmaceutical industry. They're not the enemy. We just have to find a way to work together. Um, these are conferences that occur. So for my uh, physician colleagues, I want them to be, you know, to consider this type of educational opportunity. And we're going to stop using medicines to cure something because they don't. We're going to use them just to manage symptoms temporarily. And then we're going to focus on diet as our main tool of engagement. And I decided that if I'm going to reach more of my colleagues, I need to do research. So I'm actually going to be partnering uh, with some organizations to start doing research, probably more around low blood sugars and then kind of branch out from there. I just think that that'll add more legitimacy to the work we're trying to do. We started a diabetes prevention program because so many people are borderline diabetic. We're doing that within our medical group, and it's a program that uh, uh, Centers for Medicare and Medicaid are actually approved to help teach people about this. And then finally, we do educational summits within Advocate. I'll be doing one again at the end of the month. And, um, and then, you know, we've learned a lot, but I wanna just end on a couple of thoughts before we go to questions. Uh, the blame game. So, yes, calories in may equal calories out, but the reality is not really. And I always use the example of broccoli and, you know, a slice of cake. A thousand calories of slice of cake is going to have a different impact on your body than a thousand calories of broccoli. That's common sense, you know. So that, that's, that's not correct. Eat less, exercise more is what we tell people. That don't work. You cannot exercise. I think you have to run three miles to burn like four chicken nuggets from McDonald's. Who's going to do that? <laughs> Nobody. So it's really diet. I'm telling you, it's right. And fasting does increase metabolism and we got to stop blaming the patient because we gave them the wrong advice. They have a gag order uh, on the Biggest Loser contestants. They cannot tell people that they've gained weight. Why? Because you can do a great job on the program, but who's going to keep doing it? It's not sustainable. So that's why they have a gag order. So to achieve the impossible, we must do what's possible every day. And what's possible for me is I, I post something every month. I come to events like this. I sh share messages with my patients. I encourage people. I want you guys to do the same. Uh, it's really very simple. Just stay within what you do and then spread that message. And this is, again, for people who are looking for more evidence. They have way more evidence than here. But looking up those journals are just to su support and substantiate this way of thinking. So what I'll try to do is play this video. So that's, that's got to touch your heart. So, so, so my message, my final message to you guys is uh, if you're going to be an effective leader, you have to sharpen the saw. Who taught us that? Seven habits. Covey, right? So if you don't take care of your body, you're, I don't care how much you push for it, you're not going to reach that that ideal state is not happening. So take care of self first, and then maybe you can do something great for the rest of the world. So that's gotta be one of the top five things that you focus on. And for me, I even, I had a sniffle this weekend. I was, my medical assistant had a sniffle Friday. I got a sniffle Saturday, I was like, oh, it's coming. But I told myself, no, you're not gonna let this happen. I promise you, I was worried about today. But when you take care of yourself, even when you get something in your body, it don't even stay. It just comes and 
pays you a visit, and I hadn't had one cough, I just felt something. So take care of yourself first, and then you'll be able to make the big impact. So, so we'll see how much time we have, but I can definitely entertain a couple of questions, okay? All right. So any questions about anything? Get Nigel to tell you a story. Okay. You want to tell a story? Would you like a Jolly Rancher? <laughs> 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 Once you ask your question. Well, you want to say something, Nigel? No, yeah, I, go ahead. I, want, no, I, I normally I've started telling people this in my own classes now, but I met Tony when we were in Greece a month ago, and I went from Santorini to Athens, stayed in a really expensive hotel, and we ate in really expensive places, and I gorged like a pig for about a week. And then I went back to the States and continued to gorge like a pig in the States. Now, I'm vegetarian. I eat fish. I'm a pescatarian. And my wife's sitting in front because I asked her to come and watch Tony speak today. Uh, she's a chef. So I eat very, very, very well. And, um, but for years, we did the low-fat thing. And uh, my wife especially did the low-fat thing because she had uh, medical problems meant she couldn't have... Uh, she had a high triglyceride level anyway. So I listened to this whole fasting thing. We all downloaded this application called Zero, which is a free app from the App Store if you're on the iPhone. I think it's on the Android platform as well. And we started trying this 16-hour fast. So basically you stop eating at 8 at night and you don't eat until noon the next day. And you can vary that a little bit, but that's the sort of the ideal spread. And it was really, really, really hard. But just like I quit smoking 20 years ago, I did the same thing with this, this ultra low carb diet. I actually just went cold turkey. I cut all sugar instantly. Stopped drinking tea as a Brit. That's really, really hard. With heaping four spoons of sugar in every mug of tea. And I cut all the soda. I cut all the juices. I even cut out the, you know, the so-called natural fruit juice. Just cut it all. And then I started doing the fasting. And breakfast is really, really hard. There's a couple of things you get. In the first few days, they call it the ketosis flu, where you start to feel a bit, <sighs> and no energy and everything else. And you also get insatiably thirsty, and the thirst continues. And I actually drink gallons of water. I've, I've started drinking Perrier, because there's no added sodium in it, unlike San Pellegrino, which has added sodium. So I drink sparkling waters, and a great tip is a couple of glasses of sparkling water before you order food, and it gasses you up, you don't eat as much. That's a really easy way to slow down on how much you're eating. So I'm drinking a lot of water, but in three and a half weeks, I lost 21 pounds. So that's about 11 kilos in, in European money. And I, weighed, I was 185 pounds when I started, and I'm only five foot six and a bit. So 185 pounds when I started, I'm now down to 161 pounds. That was as of last Sunday when I weighed myself. And I only weigh myself once a week, so I'm not sort of getting that whole <laughs> type sort of feeling. But I cut all the sugars, I cut all the carbs, and I'm literally what, keeping myself to 20 or 30 carbs a day, so the, the yeah. sort of lower limit. And nuts have become my friend. Pineapple is my treat. It has sugar in it, but pineapple is my treat, because uh, I really love it. I wanted something to make myself feel wholesome after I've eaten food. I've eaten salad more than I've ever eaten in my life, and uh, I'll eat cucumbers like fruit, you know. Um, and eggs are great, so you can go to IHOP, and have an omelette, right. but just ignore the pancakes. And when they offer you free toast and free pancakes, right. you know, I just eat the, the omelette because it's full of veggies and omelette and cheese, and it's cool. So omelettes are great. And my wife's doing her best to adjust to my new eating habit. But I, my stomach used to really bulge. And, and literally a month ago, looked like a pregnant. Yeah, and I was my wife calls it my boot about. <laughs> now it's, it's not flat, um, and I'm, probably, I'm trying to get down to about 150, which is... My body mass index level is about right, 145, 150 pounds for my height. Um, I'm going to try and do a little bit of exercise to pull in the 50 plus year old, you know, baggage here. Uh, now the weight's gone, but it really hasn't. I'm never tired. I've Thank never you. tired. I am, a, I am hungry sometimes, but I've got my fast, my little fast app, and I know that I'm an hour away from eating something. And then I get a handful of nuts or a bit of pineapple, and that will keep me going if I'm on the run. And, and my wife made me some cool things you can get, like, she, you can buy these potato crisps from Whole Foods, but they're actually cheese. It's like a, it's like a, a, th a thin slither of cheese, and it tastes fantastic. And Jodie managed to make those for me and some other snacks as well. So I've gone really extreme, but my blood pressure went from, my average blood pressure with heavy medication was about 180 over 85 to 95, really high. I mean, that's like almost death level of blood pressure. And that's medicated. And now I'm down to between 145 to 155 over 75. It's the lowest I've been in 10 years. 
and that's just with one month of change in my eating habits, just eating habits. I mean, I can't drink the champagne I used to drink, and I'm not drinking all the, the soda I used to, to neck, but I found out Red Bull do a completely sugar-free Red Bull, and there's no carbs, zero carbs. You'd like Red Bull, I can still have a Red Bull. So there's things like that you can still do. Anyway, I just wanted to give it, because it was meeting Tony that, less than a month ago that made this change to me, and, and it's not easy, but I made the change and it really is working. So I want to say thank you to him. And it's a good case study. So there you go. Oh, you've already got a mic. There you go. Wow. Okay, <coughs> questions? Wow. Come on. I have a question about the, the, 20, the 24, the fast thing. So the consistent thing that I get from people is at breakfast, you have to eat something for breakfast. And you're saying that's not yeah, you, when you eat uh, food, it does create a, a thermal effect. You, you, you know, it's like the, the furnace does get going and you burn. So the thought was, if I get the furnace going, that's going to get the metabolism going, which is true. But what they don't factor in, so, you know, sometimes you're, my, my accountant wants me to keep a mortgage so I'll have a tax write-off, right? But She's not factoring in that I gotta pay interest, right? So am I saving more money with my deductions compared to what I'm paying in interest? The answer is of course not. So do I really need to have a mortgage? No, I need a home-based business, right? <laughs> so my whole point is, yeah, you're gonna get your furnace going, but you have to, you've then eaten all these extra calories that you didn't need to eat, right? And are you going to burn all those calories just because you got your metabolism going? No. So, it, so the net effect is negative. When they first made these recommendations, it was an assumption based on the thermodynamic uh, th relationship with food. What they didn't do is a study to see over the course of a year what happens. And when they did the study, finally they found that it wasn't really giving you a net benefit. But then when they did the study with fasting, they found that fasting actually increases your metabolism so you don't have to have those multiple meals throughout the day. Uh, think about your pancreas, that tired pancreas. Every time you eat, the pancreas has to go to work, right? It never gets a chance to rest. And we could have a whole lecture about fasting, you know, because there's so many benefits. But one of the benefits is it allows for the body to heal and to rest. So, the, what you, so when he said, when, when, when it was said that I feel I, when I get through that initial phase, I felt better. I do not get hungry. If I hadn't eaten lunch for my job, I would not be hungry. If I don't drink fluids, it doesn't feel as good. So I, have to, I had to learn how to keep fluid at my desk so when I come out from seeing a patient, it kind of reminds me, have a sip. And, then, so, and I wasn't a big water drinker, but now I am. And I was not an obese guy. But what happened for me is that my numbers, my cholesterol numbers, you know, I'm eating bacon and eggs when I do eat breakfast and my cholesterol got better. That's the weirdest thing. It got better. So that's the funny part. But isn't your cholesterol control by your liver? Yeah, I mean, the, the, absolutely. And, and the problem is this. If you, if you talk to Dr. Jason Fong about what diabetes is, he'd say that it's mostly a liver congestion problem because when you take things like fructose, it's primarily metabolized in the liver. So you send all this influx of fructose to the liver, your liver can't handle it, it gets clogged with fat and now the liver can't work properly. So, so yeah, the liver has a huge impact on cholesterol and how you metabolize and you're not going to do a good job of doing that if it's clogged up with sugar. So sugar has a negative impact on all these different pathways in terms of how you're trying to stay, stay healthy. So you're absolutely right. Uh, have there been any studies on this type of diet and if it can impact fatty liver? Um, yes. Um, you know, to be honest with you, the first thing that's going to benefit from this diet is the liver because what, when I talked, when I gave the example of uh, how you store your sugar as glycogen or fat, glycogen is stored in the liver and in muscle. So if you're fasting, the first thing that's going to happen is you're going to, you're going to clean out the liver basically and remove all the fat. That's like the first thing. So your, your liver is going to be the happiest 
uh, person. Uh, fatty liver disease is a big issue in our country. We used to think it was primarily because of alcohol. Now it's primarily because of our weight and sugar content. So, so if we're looking to and fix that problem, which is part of the metabolic syndrome, then that's the fastest ticket to get there. I don't expect everybody to be fasters. However, for those who are busy like me, it's cheap, <laughs> it's easy to do because you don't have to go to the restaurant to do it. And I was like released because I, if I didn't eat breakfast, I felt I had done something wrong. And now I feel great. I was actually nervous about eating lunch coming here because I'm not used to eating lunch, right? So I thought it's gonna make me a little draggy, but it didn't. I love being as sharp as I was at eight in the morning when I see my three o'clock patient. I'm just as sharp, energetic, because I'm not clogged with all of that stuff I had from lunch. So you'll find once you get accustomed to this that you're gonna be particularly sharp. I, I wanna remind you about MCT oil, medium chain triglyceride oil. I usually put that in my coffee or, you know, I'll just get a tablespoonful because that'll force your body, that's like a fat from coconuts, and that'll force your body to burn fat as energy and your body, your brain loves ketones to use it as a source of energy. So if you're not familiar with MCT oil, if you want to accelerate this process, I would add that. But just start with a teaspoon and work your way up because it can make you go to the bathroom a little bit in the beginning. So don't overdo it. But, so there's a lot of tricks and that's why I suggest that you follow myself and then some of those other authors in the slides because there are, uh, there's a wealth of information out there and we need a lot of people pushing us towards diet, but the powers that be are looking at their best interests. And there's a lot of interest in financial gain and maintenance of disease as opposed to reversal. So we have to kind of support each other to move us in the right direction. Oh, what about the preferred meal of uh, adult beverages? <sighs> You know what, let me tell you one of the biggest secrets you'll need to have besides looking at labels and trying to get under 50. Every time you make a decision, just go to Google and just type in low carb alcohol, low carb whatever. So because of, I, I learned from my patients, so if, I'm, if I see Michelob Ultra Light, which probably tastes like water, I don't know. I know that's only like two, maybe three carbs. The average beer is probably gonna be 22 carbs. A Chardonnay, because that's something that my family likes to indulge in, may only be four carbs. So you can actually drink alcohol. You decide what your carb number is gonna be, and then you make sure you don't get over it, no matter what you're ingesting. But there's plenty of alcohols. Unfortunately, the harder alcohols are the ones that don't have a lot of carbs, to be honest with you. But that's, so you can still indulge, and in moderation, your liver can handle that and you should be able to do it. The main thing is that use some common sense, but set some targets. And if your target is to lose 20 in a short amount of time, then you, you want to do fasting and all the things we talked about. If you're just trying to be there tw a year from now, then you can kind of ease into it. Your life will be fundamentally different when you make these simple changes. You can come to a conference like this, you're going you're to walk away with various uh, techniques, scrum, etc. right? But imagine getting that extra little surprise gift you weren't expecting. And, and you're gonna have the energy to do, apply those principles because you just feel good. I get up at 4.30, I'm at work by six, and I don't start till eight. Imagine what you can accomplish in two hours with, that, with, with you know, nobody there to kinda bug you and drive you nuts, right? I never did that, but I feel like doing it. And I have the energy even after I finish my next project, I have a mentoring thing from four to six today, I'll have the energy to go home and be a husband to my wife. And that's really what this is all about, balance and feeling good and staying healthy. And, and when you are free, you can actually enjoy yourself and not be sitting in bed sick because you didn't take care of your body. So, so I just have a comment. Um, since Santorini, I didn't set any goal I stopped, and I, I just hit my lowest weight I've ever hit for 20 years. I haven't been good, perfect. I still had some french fries here and there and a beer, but I think 
looking back, I think most of it was I stopped eating cereal and went to the eggs. Right. And then I, I skipped lunch, which I used to do, but then people told me, oh, you gotta do three meals a day, and otherwise your, your metabolism would be off. So I went back to my skipping lunch. And uh, so now I'm wondering about maybe even setting a goal, but, but even not doing that, it's made a big difference. It's, it's just, again, it's just the ease at which you can do this. Don't, um, when I learned from Paul Akers about, you know, two second lean, I learned that simplicity was the greatest gift in the world. So whatever you do, whatever you decide to do with this, keep it simple. Maybe just take one aspect of what was discussed and say, I'm going to do that just like you did. I'm just going to do that one thing. Most people think that oatmeal, we've been telling people for years, oatmeal for your cholesterol. They never took the time to read the label to see it was 38 carbs and I think it's like six fibers so you can subtract. That's 38 minus six, that's 32 net carbs. But if you're trying to be less than 50 a day, is oatmeal the best way to start the day? That's having not added anything to it. Now by the time you get to McDonald's and they have the raisins and the brown sugar, tastes so good. Now you have 52 carbs. And then you add the sweet tea to it. It's tea, so now you got the sweet tea. That's probably another 20-some carbs. So you're at 70-some carbs eating oatmeal and tea, and you thought you were doing a good job. So the point is, if you don't look at the labels, Sweet Baby Ray, who, who uses that for their barbecue? Sweet Baby Ray, what a good name, you know. And I looked at that and saw 18 carbs for every two tablespoons. I didn't know. So for the first time in my parents' life, I came to their house. They didn't want to cook. They went to uh, the rib place and ordered the ribs without the barbecue sauce. Shocking. But they were delicious. So your perception, just like I gave the pasta example, and the, your perception of what tastes good is, is a little overdone. There's some rubs you can put on that meat with no carbs in it and it tastes delicious. It's all about preparation. And be okay not getting it right. When I was a vegetarian, it was so many. Imagine trying to make a steak tofu. <laughs> My wife almost kicked me out the house. <laughs> Did not turn out well. But then over time, I got better at these types of vegetarian items. So the key is be patient, know where you're trying to go, Learn from each other. I learn a lot from my patients, right? And, and then you'll get to your goal. Um, this is regarding the MCT oils, so I've Googled it to see what it is. And coconut oil, is, can we just use coconut oil? Because it says 62% of the fats of coconut oil are MCT. Yeah, it's, it's just more, um, when you, when you want to go into ketosis, the uh, coconut oil will do it, but the MCT oil is so concentrated that it'll actually, it's almost like a, a pure form of energy. So with coconut oil, you have to kind of still break it down. With MCT oil, it's like, just use it. So that's just why. Just put a, a teaspoon of coconut oil in your coffee. Well, it. you could, but it won't have the same. Like when I started using MCT oil, and you know, what was that movie where, you know, the guy took a pill and he could think really? Oh, um, limitless. Yeah, limitless, right? Anybody say, it, it, I'm not saying it was that extreme, but I felt like I'm sharper. And in my profession, you want your doctor to be sharp. So that's what I felt like when I first started my journey. A little bit of it was because I put it in coffee, right? But I felt phenomenal. So what's going to happen is you're going to get more bang for your buck with the MCT oil. But I think that if you, you so what you do is you add the coconut oil to your smoothie. You won't even taste it or notice it, right? You cook with it. It sounds crazy, but you gotta add the fat. You really want your diet to be about 60% or maybe a little bit higher of fat, which sounds crazy. But when I showed you that graph where your sugar didn't go up at all, that's why. So you want, so whenever I cook vegetables, I try to throw oil on, put the oil wherever you can. And, and you'll be shocked and amazed. At the minimum, you should do the experiment to see what happens to your body. really interesting because I have a friend who um, is vegetarian but he, she talks about 
just a toxin that you get from like the meat and everything else. So that's why she went all the way to uh, being a vegetarian. Yeah. So what do you think about that? Your thoughts on that? Well, you are talking to an ex-vegetarian. I've seen every documentary about, you know, what we do to animals. I still, every time I eat a piece of chicken, I just, you know, I, I pause and then I take a bite. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, right, you know, what you gonna do, you know? But, um, so, and I, I love this whole, you know, free range. He had a good life while he was here, you know? <laughs> so, I still have mixed emotions about it. Uh, I am more concerned, however, with being healthy. So, the studies that I've read say that if you um, combine leafy green food with that meat, you're okay. If you eat, and you need more leafy green food if you're eating processed meat, like bacon, right? So, so regular meat is going to increase your risk in theory, but it balances out. So the key, and that's why I think Atkins did a great, great job of making us aware of this uh, low-carb diet, but if we don't add the green stuff, then you're really setting yourself up for, you'll be thin and you won't have diabetes, but cancer may sneak up on you down the road. So, so I think, so again, what I would say to your friend is if that works for you and she's not doing a starchy version of her vegetarian, she's right on, you could argue that a vegetarian low starch diet is probably the healthiest diet, but you don't have to go that far. And, I'm, and, and so if you, and I think that there's, it's easier, I think there's probably more vegetarians that are not doing it the right way that are going to harm themselves than who are doing it the right way. You got to be on it if you're doing that, but if you do this low carb, high fat, it's kind of easy to figure that one out. So I think for the pop, I, I may have had 5% of my patients convert their diet with the vegetarian diet. With the low carb, high fat diet, I'm up to about 30%, maybe 40 So. And it's so impressive that Advocate Healthcare, who I work for, noticed and said, what are you doing? So it's all about what's going to work for the most number of people. In my patient population, they were not, they tried, they just couldn't do the vegetarian thing. So, so for me, this was like the yield. And I was so happy because when I was going to write a vegetarian book about how to fix your diet and fix your diabetes, right? So when I discovered that you didn't have to do that, that A to Z study was the turning point, that was kind of a relief because I said, oh, people may actually buy the book because <laughs> they will actually do this. They will not do this whole vegetarian thing. It's not sustainable. When you have everybody else in your family doing something completely different. I can sit at the table with the greens and black eyed peas and lima beans, avoid the macaroni, spaghetti, and the dressing, not use the barbecue sauce, I can be at the same table with my family and feel like I'm not an outlier. If I, if I had to do a vegetarian thing, that would be a tough thing in my household. So, that's, so it's just an easier sell. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much. All right, buddy. So I want to wish everybody good luck on your journey. Again, follow me in the virtual world. I'll be out there. All right. You all have a copy of uh, Dr. Tony's book? And, uh, and I'll hand out my, I'll give my, leave my business cards. Outstanding. Too. Excellent. Thank you so much.